you have the sense that some of his motivation was a love for all people and social justice and yes. equality? Yes, I believe that was a major factor. He had that inside him. Um, I, because my listening, viewing audience is diverse faith-wise, I have listeners who are very faithful and traditional, moderate, and some that are skeptical. Um, and of those who are skeptical, they would probably paint a picture like this, that uh, maybe, maybe the revelation would have happened in the 60s, but there were some, you know, for, for any significant change to happen, there needs to be total unanimity between the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve, and there were clearly apostles who were opposed, and so they couldn't achieve unanimity back then. And when the combination of the civil rights movement flaring and the protests against BYU and the black wristbands and the um, sort of the PR nightmare that it might have been. There's rumblings of like the church's tax exempt status being threatened. And just this sense that once the right apostles die off, then it's easier to, to build this consensus that then you could achieve unanimity, you know, sort of a very cynical um, naturalistic explanation. How would you, I, is, I mean. I'd say I see no inconsistency. I mean, that, that's what I, I think all of those things are true. Even the tax exempt status part? I sure, mean, I mean, the, those, are, those are factors that made people think about the issue and the, the consequences of making change. And uh, it, uh, it doesn't, to, to me, run counter to the real reality of revelation. It just describes the circumstances in which the revelation came. And if it takes some apostles to die before the time is fully ripe, well, that's just the way it is. I, see, so I, maybe I'm missing your point. No, that's a great answer. Um, but some would, some would say, if this is God's one and only true church and God is not a respecter of persons, our church should have been marching with Martin Luther King in Selma, Alabama and leading the civil rights movement, not following. And they would say, if this is God's church and he's at the head, he could have had those apostles die earlier and he could have just sent the bat phone in the 50s or 40s. You know, there's, there's sort of this impatience and this and, and, and it flies against the human condition that bad things happen and that things are imperfect and messy sometimes. But I would love your response to those expectations or hopes or wishes. Uh, I agree with nearly everything you've said. Uh, that is, I, I believe that, uh, uh, that it's too bad we didn't act sooner and more energetically in favor of civil rights. Uh, you have statements at general conference in favor of civil rights for blacks. Uh, from, so there were the, it isn't that there was no inclination on the part of the church, but the church is made up of people who are fallible. And uh, the, the uh, uh, and I don't know why bad things happen to good people. Uh, this is it's just part of the picture that either we believe that uh, the Lord or or orchestrates every item of conduct and so that all things uh, come together to fit the pre-written scenario uh, or we declare ourselves uh, incompetent to, to answer the big question of, and I, that's where I am. Uh, I, I recognize the difficulties. I, empathize with some of the criticisms or questions that are raised. And yet, uh, I, I believe and uh, hope that uh, we're, we're ultimately going to get there in the right place, but that it, it doesn't happen magically and it doesn't happen uh, at the same pace uh, with fits, fits and starts. We, but uh, I guess all I can say from my exposure to my father and to a slight extent to others of the church leaders 
uh, that they're men of goodwill and uh, they deal with these big issues out of their own understanding and misunderstanding. So I'm, uh, I guess I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll take the middle road. I love the middle road. It's my favorite <laughs> road, personally. Um, your dad also was, was president during the Equal Rights Amendment. Do you have any recollections or memories about his feelings about women, about feminism, about his role in, in that whole deal, or his reflections upon it? Uh, the Equal Rights Amendment is a little bit of a puzzle to me because I th think that the church uh, believes in and did believe in the equality of women. Uh, and uh, you'd say, why object then to articulating what you believe? And uh, there was a feeling in the leadership of the church that uh, there was more to this than simply the almost platitudinous saying we believe in equal rights for for women that there was something that was likely to go amiss and uh, this this is just me i don't have anything official to for this but that's the way i rationalize the objection to the era that uh, that it may have had something to do with uh, a denigration of the family. We have been pretty big on family as a, a central thesis theme for, uh, for the church. And uh, I think we may not yet have seen what dangers lie ahead for the family. Uh, the Equal Rights Amendment didn't pass, but I think that the sentiments that it uh, reflected have general currency but so uh, i'm a little puzzled myself about it why why the desperate fight against it why to make it a, a political battle that didn't appear to do us any good and the only answer i have to offer is that uh, uh, it it didn't come out of a denigration of women. And I offer as some evidence of that the fact that uh, this, this same leadership, the presidency of Spencer Kimball, uh, institutes a women's meeting like General Conference, a, a, a young women's meeting in the spring like we're about to have again. Uh, uh, things like uh, allowing women to pray in sacrament meeting, things that had been part of the church practice. These are little things, uh, instructions to the bishops that they should uh, recognize girls' achievements equal to those that they acknowledge are boys' achievements. And uh, so some of the articulation of, uh, of the ideal of women being equal to men and uh, gets expressed in general conference. I mean, you, I think if with a little effort I could make a long list of smaller items that are uh, taken together an endorsement of the fact that we had been backward in recognizing women's equality and that it was time that we took steps to improve. Oh, uh, women uh, leaders of the women's auxiliaries sitting on stand at general conference. Uh, women leaders of, in the church uh, speaking at general conference. You know, so uh, those are those and there are surely others that reflect uh, an, a willingness and an eagerness to see happen uh, the same things that the Equal Rights Amendment was supposed to help. Were you, were you disappointed when the ERA amendment went down at the time? No, I didn't care very much, I guess. I, I thought it was simply a statement of a, of a truism. I see. I, was, I, was not, I haven't been politically involved very much. But you supported the principles of equality behind oh, it? Oh, yes. Yeah. 
You bet. And if I thought that the Equal Rights Amendment was necessary to achieve that, I would have taken that position. But uh, it didn't, didn't seem to me, it seemed to me mostly a tempest in a teapot. I see. Um, a lot of our listeners are, maybe some of them are familiar with the Leonard Arrington administration in church history. I believe that started around 72, which would have been before the what, what started 72? Leonard Arrington's administration as church oh, historian. Oh, the historian's office, okay. I believe that started around 72, and I believe it ended around 82. So it wouldn't have started in your father's administration, but it would have ended in your father's administration, I believe. Um, you, know, you were a former board member of Sunstone. Yes. I was in your office and big stacks of dialogue journals, you know, along your floor. You, I, I've seen you present at Sunstone conferences, and the church has probably, I don't want to say had a love-hate relationship, but for lack of more eloquence, I'll just say has had a love-hate relationship with intellectuals. Okay. And it seems like a lot of this, we'll call it modern intellectual um, uh, germination, kind of began in the 60s, but it really started taking hold in the 70s when your, when your father was, was president. And a lot of my listeners will be aware of, you know, Leonard Arrington being made church historian, but then having his program kind of shut down and being dismissed and having the professors move to BYU. And, you know, that was, by some historians count, a real disappointment that on the one hand, to the church's credit, there was openness and a willingness to to face tough questions and to publish credible history. On the other hand, maybe it was deemed a failure by some because ultimately it was scuttled and projects were cut and Leonard Arrington was dismissed quietly without any real public acknowledgement of his efforts. It, or at least that's how the historians who I've read have characterized that, that era. And that happened, you know, during your dad's administration. So, and I know that you just just as we were talking before, you, you were in the institute with Lowell Benyon um, and T. Edgar Lyon, and you know you are clearly. Uh, I don't know if you would self-identify, but I would think of you as a as a believing Mormon intellectual, someone mm. who. Thank you. <laughs> so, talk about um, your reflections. If you remember that era with Leonard Arrington, whether that was disappointing to you, if you know anything about your father's involvement in that your dad's general impressions of intellectuals and sunstone and dialogue and whatever you're comfortable with. That's a big question. Occasionally I ask those, but. Um, okay, let's, any, tr let's give it a try. Uh, I think my, I once accused my father of being an intellectual and he rejected it. I said, uh, but for me an intellectual is somebody who earns his living by his words, so to speak. And uh, he, he, he didn't want to be called an intellectual, and yet I characterized him it because he had uh, wide-ranging interests. He, he read a lot, uh, and I, I, uh, he wrote quite a lot, and I think wrote well. And those are, those are things I thought, think of as part of being an intellectual or being in the intellectual sphere. Uh, but he... Uh, was ambivalent, I think. I think he would have preferred that people followed along believing and not questioning. And yet he knew that that was not the way the world works and that people have all a range of attitudes from the most believing to the most skeptical. And uh, he, he just couldn't have his druthers. Um, so I think with respect to dialogue and Sunstone, uh, he knew I was involved. He never was critical of it. Uh, I think he w would have wished it otherwise, but was accepting of it. Now, as far as Leonard Arrington is concerned, Leonard uh, uh, told me that he felt my father was a re appreciative of his work. And I infer from the, some of the statements that 
it was as though he didn't want to spend his capital on fighting Leonard's battles, that they weren't important enough to him to try to dictate a different result. There clearly were several general authorities, apostles who were, uh, who were hostile to what I think of as uh, appropriately liberal uh, history. And I th I'm inferring that my father felt sorry that there was opposition, but that he wasn't about to dictate to these other people to st close down uh, their viewpoints. I sometimes wish that he had been a little bit more dictatorial, you know, saying this is the way things should be, but he was, he lived largely by consensus. I think the, the question of priesthood and the blacks uh, took years of time for the circumstances to coalesce so that it was feasible to do it in unity. And I think that much of the delay uh, was, was a seeking for unanimity and, and achieved uh, ultimately. Uh, Leonard also said that when uh, he proposed to Dad the publication of Brigham Young's journal, uh, history, biography, the American that, Moses? Yes, American Moses. That uh, Dad said he didn't want it published by Deseret Book or some other, but, but by a national publisher, press. And he wanted it to be a book that the church could be proud of as a representation of its scholarship and its ability to tell the story fully. Um, so anyway, that suggests a, a general favor, and he also, uh, there's a quote in, in the book about his dad's telling Leonard that he thought the Lord was pleased with what he was doing. Now, you put those things in the opposition that there was for um, more open history together, and, and it looks like there are differences of opinion going on. And that doesn't, doesn't bother my faith any, but I, it just uh, annoys me sometimes when my views don't dominate. <laughs> uh, you mentioned uh, Lowell Binion and T. Edgar Lyon. I, those are men whose memory I treasure. Uh, I was in the, a student in the Institute of Religion at uh, University of Utah during uh, the time those men were the principal teachers there, and I sat in their classes and. Uh, I had more to do with Lowell Binion and have a reverence for him and his memory that, uh, that is important in my life story. Do you sense that your father uh, had affections for, for Brother Binion? Or do you even, did they I, know each other? I, I'm trying to recall. Uh, I had personal contacts with him and I know that they were acquainted but how close their interactions I were, I don't know. You use the word capital and how your, um, your, your father didn't feel comfortable using his capital in defense of, it's a, it's, a, it's a touchy subject, but I think it's a real one. I think that, again, when I talk about the superficial, simplistic perception, it's that the prophet rules the church and whatever he says goes. Well. To use the word capital indicates that it's, there's, there's a political nature, there's an administrative nature, that you have to, as you said, build consensus, that it's not just, okay, here's what we're doing this year, and here's what we're doing this month, and you leave these guys alone, and I'm supporting these guys. You would think that, to be honest, that almost speaks in both your father's favor and the church's favor, that that's not, when someone assumes the role of prophet, that they don't become a dictator. But why don't they? And, and how do we get comfortable with the notion of um, not jockeying, but diplomacy and capital and negotiations and coalitions? How do we get comfortable with that? 
How do you get comfortable with that? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I am comfortable with it. And uh, I, I suppose I am the product of my parents and my education and my friendships. And uh, I guess uh, asking qu hard questions uh, is not been uh, a problem. I, I'm quite content to say, maybe you think that the flood covered every inch of the Earth's surface, but uh, I'm sorry, I, I don't get that one yet. I've got lots of questions. I, I'm a, a, a believer-doubter. I, I try to believe as much as I can, and what I can't, I don't. But uh, I, I, I just and I'm unable to uh, to write a prescription for somebody else. Uh, I can suggest that it doesn't bother me that uh, there are a lot of things I don't know and, and that it shouldn't bother them, but that doesn't really change people very much. I think most of it is comes from inside. It comes from a desire to to want to believe maybe, to to want the, the obvious sociological comforts that there are in a community that that's, uh, cares about one another. But uh, how else? How else? And I, I remember as a boy lying on the grass and looking up at the stars and thinking, what is there beyond the stars? Um, I, I couldn't conceive of an end to the stars, nor could I conceive that it didn't somewhere end, that there was no end to it. Well, the, that the simple impossibility of believing both of them, uh, and I, unwillingness to believe none of them, uh, leaves me without answers to a lot of things. So, um, what, like, I, I assume you're you're familiar with the with the more challenging aspects of our church's history. I think so. I'm, I consider myself an amateur historian. So you know, there's, you know, Joseph Smith's polygamy and the polyandry. There's. Um, there's, you know, the Masonic, you know, stuff that that's in relation to the temple ceremony. There's, um, you know, the blacks and the priesthood thing. There's, uh, there's DNA in the Book of Mormon. You know, challenges to the historicity of the Book of Mormon, and many of the people that I interact with, those those uh, factors become overwhelming to their shelves, and their shelves that you referenced cave in. They, they find that, that their shelves can't support the weight of all those tough questions. Um, so somebody who knows all these issues but still remains a believer can seem not only curious but somehow I don't want to say unbelievable, but just like marvelous or incredible. <laughs> yeah. um, so I'm always fascinated in, in hearing people talk about how their shelf keeps from caving in and what the pillars of their faith are. Are you comfortable sharing yours? Well, I'll, I'll try to stab at it. Uh, a question like that deserves a lot more articulation than I can give it. But uh, much of my reaction to the question is uh, that I simply do believe and that it, I, it isn't just a question of choosing. Uh, I can choose to try. I can choose to act in a way consistent with the gospel's truth, the church's validity. But ultimately, uh, it, it is a question of whether you allow yourself to be overwhelmed by the doubts and the difficulties, or you say, those are things I don't understand. They're mysteries to me. 
And uh, if I'm going to be wrong, I'd rather be wrong on this side of the fence than on the other side of the fence. But, you know, there's some things, uh, if you talk about pillars of my faith, one thing that's always intrigued me and, and uh, given me some support is chiasm in the Book of Mormon. I've worked at that and tried to write some myself and find uh, that to create a credible chiasm of which there are a great many in the Book of Mormon just is, is not the job of a boy. Not, the, not even the job of a man or a wise man. It's, a, it's an incredible task. And uh, the Book of Mormon as an artifact, just as a thing to, to think about, to say, where did it come from? What produced this? And how, uh, those, those things are sufficient to me to call for uh, reserving final judgment saying, uh, I, I accept knowing that uh, I could be wrong. I, I don't know anything. I believe quite a lot of things, but I don't bear my testimony very often because I, I'm reluctant to say I believe when people expect you to say I know. And uh, I, so I keep my counsel most of the time, I'm, I'm being pretty public about it today, but uh, I don't do that very often. I do it because you ask sincerely, and it, it exposes me. It, mean, it means I have to <coughs> concede the, the real limitations on both my intellect and my spirit. Uh, but, uh, and I, I don't know how to persuade anybody else to to believe me or follow me in, in my course, but uh, uh, people have to make their own decisions. And <clears throat> I, I'm open enough to think that many people are better off Catholic and Baptist or atheist than Mormon. Uh, each person's life is, is made up of surprising variety of circumstances. And uh, uh, I, I was delighted by the statement from the First Presidency about, uh, about 1980, I think it was. From your father? Yes, from my father, that said, uh, basically, we believe that uh, Mohammed and Confucius and Socrates and Aristotle had portions of the truth and that uh, what they had was good for them, and uh, so it, it, it points to an openness again of, of spirit. I, I, they, they might not want to say it the way I said it, but I think, I think one could make a case that uh, to be a good Baptist uh, is better than to be a bad Mormon, and uh, by a long shot. Sure. There's some talk, as, as the historicity of things is challenged and as the literalness of things gets challenged. There's a lot of talk these days of believing the Book of Mormon is inspired, but not necessarily historical. Of seeing the church is inspired, but maybe not uniquely so. Maybe our church is inspired, but other churches are inspired. As seeing priesthood in our church, but as seeing God's power in other churches in other ways sort of a Unitarian Universalist strain. Um, maybe this isn't new, but there's a lot of talk of it these days as people are trying to figure out if there's a middle way between rejection and literalistic traditional orthodoxy. And, uh, you know, there's even people who say, I don't necessarily think this is the one true church, but this is my tribe and my people, and this is where I want to express spirituality. And, and there's inspiration here, but an unwillingness to to rank our church or authority relative to others. Um, maybe even a lack of concern about whether the Book of Mormon is what it claims to be. Maybe it's just good enough that it inspires. Do you have thoughts? I, I know that this is asking a lot, but do you have thoughts on that as being valid or invalid? 
Well, I th uh, with with some qualifications, I agree with uh, that. I'm I am kind of a universalist, uh, hoping at least that God will help us all to get where we will will want to be. Um, and as I said, if uh, if somebody is better suited for Catholicism than for Mormonism, then they ought to be where there. That's I, I don't know that I've ever expressed that uh, directly before, but uh, and that's all of those things that you said are true, including that uh, this is where I am and this is where I'm comfortable. This is where I. My belief, my faith is, uh, uh, feels at home. Uh, a lot of things I don't believe and uh, don't understand and don't believe affirmatively that other people do. That they, they see some things as Mormonism that I think of as uh, folklore. Uh, I think certainty is uh, a burden, and I'm unburdened. <laughs> I'm I'm one who is more comfortable being less sure. Uh, ambiguity is not a threat to me, but it's a, a kind of a challenge, a kind of a pleasure, and uh, I don't uh, I don't want to change. And I don't, there's no reason I should change because if this isn't true, it's the next best thing to true. It's the only thing I know that is closest to true. Um, and I, I, I'm more comfortable saying that this is the most true church than that this is the only true church in spite of the fact that I understand the implications of that. Even saying most true can be viewed as relegating others to an inferior status. Oh, I think it is, from my point of view. I'm, 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 I think this is the best church that I know anything about. And uh, I, I would not choose to change until I found something I like better. You haven't found it yet. <laughs> I haven't found it yet. You're 80. 80. Chances are decreasing. The likelihood of that's decreasing. Uh, I hope I make it till uh, the next, next, Ten years. Ten more? How about twenty? No, don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to be doddering any more than I am already. <laughs> okay. You mentioned, um, and this is a, on a more serious note. Many of my listeners have either left the church or have loved ones who have left the church. It's, I guess, almost two thirds of our membership have gotten active at some point or another. As I understand the statistics. You mentioned that you had a brother um, who struggled as the son of a prophet. I, I want to believe that maybe having you share some of his story at a minimum would give courage or, or encouragement to other faithful saints whose loved ones have, have left to know that even a, great, even a great set of parents can have a child go astray. But, are you comfortable telling some something about your brother to to help um, provide some context and and also w you shared some reflections about your father's maybe regrets and how he handled that? Yeah, my parents had four children. I'm the youngest. My oldest brother is Spencer L. Kimball, named after his father, and uh, I think he always had a kind of special place in his parents' life. Their pride and joy is clearly the brightest of the four. Uh, he was a faithful church member up through primary, mission, marriage in the temple, um, teaching Sunday school class, and yet at some point along the road, but really after adulthood, he came to the conclusion that it wasn't true. It wasn't what he believed. And uh, so... Around what year would that have been? Oh dear. Would it 70s, 60s, just decade? 
and I'm not even clear of that. Uh, it would be in the 60s, I guess. So before your father had become prophet? Yes, oh, okay. clearly, clearly before. Okay. Right. Um, so he's, he stopped uh, going to church. His children are all but one of them out of the church. His wife also followed him. And uh, he's good, well, he's now deceased, but he was a good person, uh, brilliant and uh, thoughtful, kindly. I'm amazed how, though kind of a gruff exterior, his children seemed to adore him. Uh, so there must have been some good there that I couldn't see. Uh, we got along fine uh, because I didn't push and he didn't pull. But it was difficult for my father, above all, for my mother too, but mostly for my father that uh, his son had gone a different road. And it was made my father feel a failure as a father, that he, had, he who had belief had not been able to inculcate that in his son. Um, Firstborn. Father pushes and says, um, one time I remember the phrase, he said, haven't you eaten husks long enough? Alluding to the prodigal son parable. And it, it got so that uh, at one point my brother wrote a letter saying, I can't maintain any relationship with you anymore. I, I need to free myself from you. But he didn't send the letter. And I think he didn't send it largely because he wanted to maintain a relationship with his mother, who was more accepting of him, though sorry, sorrowful that he uh, had abandoned what she believed and felt important. So it was, it was the most traumatic experience of my father's life to find this beloved son slipping away. Uh, it was hard, I think, on both of them, on both sides. Um, was he ostracized? Was he distanced? Was he pushed away? Was he shunned at all? By his parents? Or siblings? No. No, I think uh, not. They were... Uh, uh, no, things were always cordial. And of course, we all had lives in different places. Uh, I don't often see, I didn't often see them at the same time or at all because uh, we were apart. But there were regular family reunions where everyone Family reunions together. type things. When my parents. 60th wedding anniversary, the kind of thing. Um, he, wrote a, he wrote an autobiography in which he uh, tells his story and uh, s some of the things like uh, not sending the letter are things that he has expressed. I think he re regretted the fact that his parents didn't see the same way he did. You know, he was egotistical enough to be sorry that they were caught up in something that he thought was not true. I think that was distressing to him, but not much. I think it was mostly he just ignored the church after he decided that it, was, it wasn't for him. Though he did ask that there not be a funeral service uh, when he passed away, and so there wasn't uh, a formal service. We met at the mortuary and said good things about him. And uh, one of the things I said was that whenever my family went to his home for dinner, uh, we used to live in Wisconsin at, uh, at the same time uh, for a while. Uh, he always called on me to pray for, over the food. So, that, I mean, there was no hostility. He was quite comfortable in according me my thoughts, and I never challenged him over his. We, at a detente.
Do you sense that your father regretted how he pushed, maybe? I can't answer that. I, I'm sure he regretted what the outcome was of the pushing. But I think he would have, if he realized that it really was alienating his son, I think he would have done differently. He tried, but he just seemed unable to resist that one more plea. Son, this is too important for you to ignore. Uh, just, I'm, I'm sorry because I saw a lot of pain on both sides. And I think in my, the, my own view that it would have been better to leave his son alone with respect to the question that divided them so severely. Did you try and be there for your brother? Did I? Were you there? Did you try and be a support to him or? To him, no. I, I just, he went his way and I went mine as far as church was concerned. Uh, I loved my brother. He was, he was good to me and good for me. We had the same profession and uh, uh, so I think he related more to me than he did to the other two children. And we were further apart in age, which may have helped. <laughs> that must have helped, yeah. <laughs> There's some discussion, I believe, in your book uh, about the book, The Miracle of Forgiveness, and how um, maybe a short story about how, I mean, some history is sort of sometimes referred to the, to the book as being a bit harsh. Uh, it may be a little bit like um, you, maybe encouraging the same types of feelings that your brother had. Possibly. Some harshness, some strictness, yeah. Yeah. Some, some severity. The miracle of forgiveness is a, a much dis, distributed book, mostly by people who think somebody else needs it. Um, but it, it, it's a book that is challenging, demanding. Uh, as you say, some may think even harsh. Uh, it's the result of years of dealing with people with troubles. Uh, in the old days, people used to walk uh, into the church office building and say, uh, can I see Brother Smith or uh, is one of the apostles available and uh, walk in and be counseled? Or the telephone rang at home and it was somebody who was in trouble. Uh, so, so over years, Dad uh, crystallized a kind of approach to problems that people brought to him. And uh, it, it became uh, first a list of scriptures to read and study, ponder, and then it ultimately became a book, uh, a, a big book, which got cut down to the size it is now. Uh, and it's been, I think, quite influential in the sense that a lot of people read it and they have different reactions. You've mentioned that some uh, are called to repentance and change their lives and uh, uh, are grateful for it. And, uh, a lot of us are, see ourselves depicted as sinners and, and uh, wish it, it wouldn't be said, even if it's true. But uh, I found it personally harsh in the sense that it, uh, it, it identified all the weaknesses that we have uh, physical and spiritually without, uh, uh, without enough of, uh, of grace and forgiveness. And the only thing I have to point to my father's attitude, that is the anecdote you refer to, when his former bishop was called into his office to receive some sort of calling in the church. And uh, the bishop told me that uh, as dad showed him around his office, uh, there was a row of books, The Miracle of Forgiveness, in different languages. I don't know how many, 20, 30 languages it's been translated into. And the dad pointed them out and commented on them, saying something to the effect that 
he thought sometimes he might have, should have written it a little softer. Uh, I believe that, and I hope it's true, because uh, suits my own inclinations, but uh, I think, like with my brother, sometimes uh, we achieve more by silence or by a soft word than we do by the harsh. So I want to thank you so much for your willingness to, to share with us some reflections, not only about your father, but your own impressions and feelings. I think in many ways, some of your own comments and feelings are going to be potentially even most helpful to some of the people in my audience. So I just want to thank you for that. You're welcome. Um, and maybe uh, I want to end uh, asking you maybe a two-part question, because I'm good at multi-part questions. Um, the first is you've, you've talked a bit about uh, kind of what you want your, what you would want your father to be remembered for. Uh, you talked about his, his love for people and uh, his openness to change. I'd love a story um, that maybe you could end with that sort of can leave us fresh with um, uh, an idea of how he embodied the, those ideas. Sure. And then any personal account you might have, uh, a shining moment in your life of fond reflection uh, about your interactions with him, if something comes up, if not just general impressions. With respect to the, uh, the openness to change, I think the revelation on priesthood is uh, the obvious example of that, and I, I leave that at, the, at it. Uh, with respect to loving people, uh, he, he was truly uh, such a person. With respect to loving people, one story that I have appreciated is of a time when he was anonymous. You know, we, we expect leaders to be good because they're on parade. But on one occasion, my father was in O'Hare Airport, and there was a woman who was shoving her baby on the floor along with her foot as she tried to get to the ticket counter to get a ticket because her flight had been canceled. And uh, she said the elderly gentleman asked her if he could help. He picked up the baby and held it, asked if he could give it some gum. And uh, then he went ahead of her in the line and explained to the other people that were waiting there, her predicament, and uh, they were apparently cooperative. He got her to the head of the line, he got her started with her ticket, and then left her. Uh, then some days later, this young woman in Michigan uh, saw a picture of the man uh, and recognized him as Spencer Kimball though she didn't recognize him in the airport. Uh, this was a small deed of generosity, of concern for other people that he uh, extended himself to when other people did not. But uh, I like it because nobody was watching who knew him. He was uh, doing it out of his love for mankind, really. Uh, so I like that story. Do you have a... A Maybe. shining gem? I, Do you have a, what's your fondest, best memory of your dad? You personally. We'll, we'll end on that. When I was about 16, uh, my father and I were in Southern California, and President George Albert Smith had a car there, a Lincoln Continental, uh, that he wanted to have returned to Salt Lake so he could go on the train. Uh, my father and I were asked to drive, and... Uh, I was taking a turn. We were out on the desert. Uh, I went to sleep behind the wheel of this big old car and uh, drove off the side. The crunch of gravel uh, woke me and I stopped the car, pulled off, got out and said, I guess you want to drive. And he said, I don't think you'll go to sleep again. I didn't sleep all the way back. <laughs> My father was 
away from family a lot, but uh, he also felt obligation to his family. Uh, when I was about 16, he spent a week with me. We took a vacation to the Pacific Northwest, just father and son. And uh, that's, I think, the only time I ever had really an extended time alone with him. And it was a precious time. He's a good dad. Yeah. Maybe you'll tear me up. Oh, well. Ed Kimball, I just want to thank you so much for coming on Mormon Stories. I very much enjoyed hearing your stories, uh, learning more about your father, and, and especially about your own reflections and impressions, because I think I've derived an incredible amount of value from, from the wisdom you've been able to share. So I thank you for that. You're welcome. Um, I, want to, I want to just make sure and, and note to our viewers and listeners uh, you know, that your book... Um, does a great job in discussing the presidency of, of President Kimball and, and sharing a, a lot of great scholarship um, and reflections about his life. And so I just want to um, make sure I note that and encourage listeners who are interested to, to check that out. It's also maybe worth mentioning that um, Benchmark Books, is that right? Yes. Uh, put out a special limited edition of, of your book, um, that included the full author's uh, original working draft. Uh, Deseret Book did the traditional editing. That's right. Um, but this is the full deal, and it actually has color coded the the parts that um, that were edited out, so that the the, um, the reader could know which parts were um, made the cut and which ones didn't. Uh, and um, you should make clear that it's out of print. Yeah, I, I, I talked to, is it Kurt? It's Kurt, right? Kurt yeah. Bench. He only printed like 400, 400 copies. So uh, it's going to be a rare book from the start. Um, but uh, for those of you who are able to, to get a copy, it, it looks like a fascinating book. So once again, Ed Kimball, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure and uh, best of wishes to you. Thank you. Good to meet you. as well.